Agenda, appointments, additional staff, replacement of staff, contract increases, separations, resignations, contract decreases and terminations, leaves of absence, retirements, minutes from the regular session of March 11th, 2024, special session of March 18th, 2024, and special session of March 21st, 2024. Payment to bills, budget status, and investment report school board members salaries canvassing statement and donations to the district donations are from shooty metals forest park neighborhood shirley lightsky and randy block i'm seeking a motion to approve the consent agenda with great gratitude for donations to the district i'll make the motion to approve the consent agenda second any questions? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Continuing number seven, agenda item seven, seven I'm looking to add a, as referendum projects for each facility reach and the end of the design phase, 95% completion. The board will see the designs and budget and be asked to consider approval of these plans to be issued for bidding. Here, 95% complete designs are being shared for Maine, Thomas Jefferson, and G.D. Jones Elementary. And the board is being asked to consider approval for use of soliciting competitive bids. And with that, I will turn it over. Hello, um, I'm Sharon Gould, Senior Program Manager with Nexus Solutions, overseeing the design phase for the referendum projects. So tonight, we're going to be talking about G.D. Jones, Maine, and Thomas Jefferson, which is the next big package that we're putting together. Next. So again, just to remind, our purpose today is to review the current design, how it's changed from the base referendum scope, and approve the design as we've presented to move forward to go out for the meeting. So we've had eight formal meetings with the three elementary schools. Um, we did split it apart to make sure we were focusing on the correct elementary schools. Um, fo you know, again, focusing on G. Jones, Maine, and Jefferson. And um, we did meet with the district leadership team, the building design committee, and we did touch on a couple security items just to revisit um, that to make sure that we were following protocols. So with G.D. Jones, um, the main thing that was presented to the community was the secure front entry. Um, just to touch a little bit on this, the main emphasis for some of these buildings was safety and security. Um, so we'll be touching on those items as we go through. So with that, um, we do have minimal site work here at Jones. Um, we are looking at some minor concrete repairs as part of the referendum scope, um, but nothing extensive on the outside of the building. Uh, here we have the overall floor plan. I have shaded or highlighted in green. Um, the areas of updates, updates being ADA updates, things, you know, making it better. That includes grab bars, um, handrail railings um, to make them ADA compliant, 
and then we are working to make some of the cubbies more ADA <coughs> compliant with end panels um, to help to help that out. We are also adding a building sign to the front entry, so it's a little bit easier for everyone to find where the front door is in that building, and it's going to be matching the coloring and the font for some of the other building signs that are mounted on the exterior of the building. Uh, so with that, we, as part of the front secure entry sequence that we added, the work was minimal. Um, we are updating some of the HVAC that serves that area to provide better, better ventilation and heat in that front lobby. Um, it does get hot and cold in there, and part of what we're doing is expanding that for comfort. And since this is a fairly straightforward project, there's no plumbing work at all in the scope of work. Electrical, we're doing the modifications required, so the secure entry has some you know, electrical changes, some glass changes, things like that. We're also upgrading the fire alarm system for remote access. We're adding some um, additional cameras for better s surveillance updates, and we're working with Ryan and the um, district's camera, I guess, security team to coordinate the camera locations, what makes the most sense. And at this time, there's no work to replace the clock or the PA system. So before we move on, any questions with Jones? <coughs> So moving on to Maine, again the main focus of the work at Maine is the secure front entrance. Um, so we focus on that and then there's a couple site outside pieces, but that's the, this is the piece that was presented to the community. Next. Um, so on the site side of this in the back, um, we did provide a fire department access lane, nothing complicated. We widened a piece of asphalt out there and added some concrete to get the fire trucks per the fire code for access to all parts of the building. Um, and then the fencing that was part of the base referendum scope was completed prior to us starting our project. So here's the floor plan of um, the areas of work. We have the secure entry. We rearranged some of the doors to provide the standard flow that we're moving through. Move some cameras around for better um, visuals. And then the green again is highlighting the ADA work that we're doing. Um, some, again, some handrails on a ramp. Um, we're adding vertical grab bars to different toilets, um, updating the electric water coolers to ADA, and um, there, th there was some ADA casework that was included in the scope of work, but it was removed because of those pieces were already removed out of the hallways. Next. So mechanically, there was no work. But in the plumbing, that's part of the water coolers. And just so you know, that does include bottle fillers at each one of those places. And it does include pipe wrap at, a, at select toilet rooms for protection for someone in a wheelchair to hit, you know, hit the piping under sinks and things like that. Pretty straightforward. Electrically, um, we're changing you know, security cameras, everything, things like that to help with the change in the um, security sequence. Um, we're updating the power of the bottle fillers, <laughs> rearranging, adding a couple cameras as well. And then we're also updating the um, fire alarm system for remote access. So any questions about Maine? Pretty simple, pretty straightforward. <coughs> All right, so Thomas Jefferson, um, what we was presented to the public was the secure entry at the Maine office. Also, um, some pupil service renovations. We're looking at the parking lots and security, and we'll start talking through those as we go through the presentation on our solutions. So next. So with that, um, the configuration changed a few times with this parking lot. Um, so we have the 4K parking lot focusing on parents walking their kids to the building. Um, we do have 50 parking stalls um, that would accommodate the full load that was presented to us as the need. Um, a couple islands based on the city requirements. We are doing some concrete, um, actually not so much any concrete repair, but new concrete work. And then, um, I don't know, Ryan, if you want to touch on just the asphalt repairs and some fencing. Yeah, this, this site, which is similar to a lot of our other elementary schools since referendum, a lot of the work was done prior to. So we do have an area, if you look on the north side of the school, where most of the etched paint is, that area is broke up. So we're gonna, we'd like to replace that square footage of area. And then there may be some um, 
maybe a small piece of concrete or two in front of the school that is beat up. Um, and then just north of the new parking lot, we're going to relocate the fence. Uh, you can see a line running from, from east to west. We're going to relocate that fence for safety purposes. Otherwise, it's pretty self-explanatory. So inside the building, um, we do have the secure front entry office remodel, which is highlighted on the main floor plan in purple. Um, and we also had a couple ADA upgrades where we're including the vertical grab bars in some of the toilet rooms. We're replacing some door hardware that's not ADA compliant. And I, we're re replacing an electric water cooler with the bottle filler um, that's also highlighted in green. So just to point out the larger floor plan, you can see we have the furniture plans included. So the area that's in the larger box shows the four new offices for the student services area. Um, where the old office was and then the new front office is down below where you have the secure entry sequence um, the nurse the health office the principal's office a conference room and some other toilet rooms that are serving the school um, hallways so um, pretty contained as far as remodeling goes um, got, had a lot of good feedback from the principal and he reached out to his staff to make sure that their needs were met and so I think we have a fairly straightforward floor plan here, design moving forward. Next. So this is the color palette for the new areas. We did try to bring in some of the school colors. This is the only part of this project that has any kind of finishes that um, you know really could make an impact. Um, some of the green walls are just shown where um, different highlight what your you know, highlight walls, I know there's a better term for that, but um, accent walls, there we go. Um, so we have some accent walls in there, and then the other two buildings is just an extension of the existing finishes. There was no place to um, add anything new or dress it up or things like that. So again, these are focused on the new remodeled areas in, at Jefferson. Next, so the mechanical work, we updated the HVAC system to deal with the changes. Uh, we are, um, adding in some radiant heat, we're adding an exhaust fan for the toilet rooms, plumbing, we're updating the piping, um, and then replacing that one drinking fountain with the ADA compliant drinking fountain with the bottle filler. And then electrically, next. Um, again, we're extending the systems in the new remodeled areas, updating the bottle filler. Um, we are updating the lighting in the office to be LED. Um, we are putting in new light poles for the city requirements into the parking lot, so we're working with that. We're adding a couple of video cameras throughout the building or outside, and then there's no direct work with the clock or PA systems here either. And um, I believe there's a fire alarm system upgrade that is not on this list to get remote access to the fire alarm system. So that's it for. Thomas Jefferson. So, any questions about what you saw at Thomas Jefferson? Jim, I just have one. I guess it would apply to all the elementary schools. Recall we contracted with the safety, the school safety expert. Have all of his recommendations been incorporated to all the elementary safety and security ones that we've done? So, a lot of what we were doing is this front entry sequences. So, we did sit with him in the beginning and get feedback from him, the police department, and others. So as far as, I think his general focus is more on the other areas, um, employee behavior and things like that, but we have been sending him copies of the secure entry sequence. And we did just re-engage with Ken Trump on these plans just to make sure we were all on the same page again. And there were no, we tweaked a you know card reader or two, um, but generally there was no major changes from what we've been doing so far. Okay, good. Other questions? Well, that's very good to hear because we security, safety and security was a big push for all of our elementary schools. Any other questions? If not? Well, we, we'll still go through the budget. The exciting part. <laughs> right, the real so exciting I'll, part. What? The real exciting <laughs> part. So um, we do not have any alternates that we're pursuing at this time for this project. There was nothing that really made sense, so the project's going to go through as a complete package. And then 
the budget portion of this is um, you have the original referendum column um, for Jones, Maine, and Jefferson, and then we did a winter re <coughs> and um, up updated some of that. The, these buildings were in design, so we could take some of the existing design that went into that. And as a team, we believe it's best to remain with those re-estimated numbers because there hasn't been substantial change since that time. So if you look at the 95% design column, you have the three per building, and then it lumps into 1.5 million six, 1.5 million six thousand for the for the three project buildings coming in together. Okay. And then, so what we're recommending is to move forward with G.D. Jones, Maine, Thomas Jefferson Elementary Schools building renovations. Um, we're asking the board to approve the plan designs for G.D. Jones, Maine, Thomas Jefferson Elementary Schools as presented to be issued from bidding. Any questions? Can we go back to the budget sure. one more time? I'm just looking at the numbers there and what the referendum original was versus winter of 2023 and now at this point in time. Um, a lot of that is due to inflation, uh, to what, what are some of the reasons for uh, the increase being, especially at Thomas Jefferson? Uh, great question, thank you. So this winter we had, um, I think we had a, a design come in high and the board thought that would be a good time to ask Nexus to go back and kind of re-estimate all the remaining projects so we could see where really are we in terms of the remaining budget for the 2022 referendum. <coughs> so that's what you see in that middle column there, that 2023 re-estimate. And that takes into account kind of the two years of inflation that we've had since this was approved. So we have the re-estimate and then the 95% design are, are in line. So that's why those columns are the same. And just to give a little context, at the next uh, board meeting on the 22nd, we will bring a complete budget picture for you. Uh, on Friday, we actually just got the East bids, so we'll bring those in front of the board and share them with you. And just one comment, um, which I've said before, but we may have new listeners or watchers today. When any of these projects go over the original referendum funding, that does not mean that we are spending additional money. We cannot, so the referendum is what it is. We cannot go over it we are restrained to the amount that the public approved. What it does mean is it might eat out of other projects or more commonly eats out of that district-wide um, project plus our uh, interest that we've earned. So um, it is not any additional spending from the district. It's just we have to decide where to spend it. Exactly. Good point to be brought up at this time. Any other questions? Not, I'm seeking a motion to approve plan designs for Maine, Thomas Jefferson, and G.D. Jones Elementary as presented to be issued for bidding. So moved. Second. Any further questions? If not, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you very much. Agenda <laughs> item 7B uh, at the Education and Operations Committee meeting. As a referendum, funded facility improvements continue to develop construction and budget updates will routinely be presented. Do we have any, that was already talked about at the <coughs> last meeting. Any additions at that, at this point in time, Josh? No further updates. Okay. And I'll go on to B2. As referendum funded improvement plans develop for each facility, the board will seek updates when the designs reach 50% completion, current plans for Wausau West athletic field will be shared with the board. Uh, I would presume we're ready for so updates. We, yep, so we, we shared this at the last meeting, the 50% design. And then I believe actually at the next meeting, then the 22nd, we'll bring the 95% design to you uh, for that action. So, but we'd be happy to answer any questions you have at this time. Are there any follow-up questions from the previous meeting? Yeah, there is. I brought one up um, about the 
fact that the Wasa West Field is being designed with the logo, and when the East Field was done, it doesn't have a logo. So I wanted to get feedback from the other members on that. If we should eliminate the logo at West, or if we're going to pay extra to install a logo at East. That would be a discussion point among the board members. Uh, cost on that? <coughs> so the we're, we're talking about the logo that yep. uh, we're going to put, supposedly put at West, and then the logo then, if we don't like the idea there's a logo at one school, do we do it at the other school? And what would the cost be in doing that is really the question. Right. Um, why isn't it the same now? Like, why were the designs different? Great question. Well, because you were going to combine the two schools, so we weren't going to have a logo at either site when we were combining secondary, when it was designed. <coughs> So at last, we could just put Wasa at each end. I think if we, I think if we go down the path of trying to make both schools and facilities exactly the same, we're going to be here for months. Um, so I, I don't. It's one about the logo. Right. Well, but that, but that's not just the logo. There's a million other things that are different about their athletic fields and where their fields are and how big they are and how many they have and stadium and seating and bleachers and everything else. And so I think it's. I don't think it would make sense to now take West's logo off the field. Um, I think it would make sense in the future to look to what we can do to add the logos on to the East field. Um, probably not part of this reference um, project, or maybe it will be when we get to the end if we have if we have those funds left over. But I think that would make more sense rather than taking the logos off the, the West field. Do we already share the estimated cost for a new logo at East? So we didn't, but we, we did ask Nexus what an initial estimate would be, um, and that initial estimate came in around $35,000 um, to put a logo at East. Uh, so we can certainly work in whatever timeline you want, but so that information is out there. I, I think it has to be, in my opinion, something that's considered when we get towards the end of our project so that we're not... I wouldn't want to not put a secure entrance out of school for it, but if we get to a point where we have a choice between some new furniture and you know, that kind of thing, then that's where I'd be interested in looking at it. So you made the comment that uh, the cost, the estimated cost would be $35,000. Yep, correct. Just for the logo. Whenever you're taking a logo out and putting one in, you're going to be taking out from the field, and it does cost. There's a lot of labor that goes into it uh, with follow up with synthetic turf. Um, I like what you just said, Lance, because of the fact that if we got it over at West moving forward, that can be worked into maybe a building and grounds uh, cost down the road at Wausau East. We don't have to make that decision right now, Correct. but it could be done later. Because I think the point made here, we could be discussing this for all these things and be here for a long period of time. Good question, and okay. uh, we got a motion on the, on the uh, table here. We don't need no, action. Not just need action. Yeah. No, okay. just just looking for direction. Okay. So that answers the question. For yeah. You. Okay. Uh, agenda B three, uh, Wasa School District faces a projected three point five million dollar budget shortfall. Administration will present the staff reduction proposal that would allow for a balanced budget for the 24-25 school year. And actually, yeah, we, we did discuss this presentation at the last meeting. Um, Tabitha and, and her folks have been working on continued um, possible reductions. We will share detailed uh, reductions in closed session with the board, so really there's nothing new to share at this point. Okay. Unless people have questions. No questions at this point in time. Uh, I, I just want to be clear. There's there's going to be, I guess that there's going to be, for lack of a better term, a lot of discussion. I think there's going to be in closed session that I, I wasn't sure was necessarily privileged that had to be in closed session. If we were talking about specific, or not talking about specific individuals, but talking about conceptually what areas were going to be addressed. 
that's something that we can't discuss in open session? So, um, by statute, what school districts have to do to non-renew staff is we have to give them a preliminary notice of non-renewal and then a final notice of non-renewal. And the preliminary notice has to be delivered by the end of this month. And so we thought we would give you an actual list of names tonight to take preliminary action. Um, then we have time to, to speak with those individuals. Uh, then the board will have another opportunity to look at that list and uh, take further action for the final notice in, uh, in May. So you actually will see names tonight. Okay. And, and um, may not agree with them and take positions off, correct. add other ones in. Correct. Other questions? All right. Continuing on, agenda item eight. Harry Hibner from the Donovan Group will share suggestions about the development of the possible operational referendum for November 2024. Yeah, thank you for coming. Just to uh, recap, everybody who is watching, uh, there, there was a, a question about whether the board would be interested in pursuing an operational referendum in light of our financial situation. Uh, so we're glad to have Perry here from the Donovan Group. You might recall um, that we, the Donovan Group has done other work for us on other referenda, uh, successful work. So thank you for being here, Perry. Thank you, Keith. Thank you, everybody, for having me here. Sorry I'm a few minutes late or um, a little longer driving from Middleton than I remembered. So. Good evening, it's great to be with you tonight. My name is Perry Hibner and I'm the lead survey strategist for the Donovan Group. I'm excited to share a little bit more about our firm and specifically our survey work. Before we get into the slides, I want to provide a little background information. Over the past three years, we have worked with approximately 50 school districts in the Midwest administering surveys, including staff climate, student engagement, parent satisfaction, childcare, and various types of community surveys most related to referendums. We are a full service firm. Besides our founder, Joe Donovan, there are also five partners who work with public school districts across the United States. We, have, uh, we, have a, we work with about, uh, school districts in about 20 states right now. In addition, I will remind you that we administered a community survey in October 2021 and a staff survey approximately two months later that provided the school board and district leaders with quality data that helped inform what turned out to be a successful capital bond referendum question in April 2022. The partner who works with most of our districts in Wisconsin is Brian Nickel. Brian joined us last year after a long career as a teacher and most recently as the communication director for Howard Swamico School District. I will also note, a little bit on the humorous side, Brian and I presented on the benefits of surveys at the WISPRA Fall Conference in 2022. Once that presentation ended, I then headed to the emergency room where I spent two plus hours as staff work because I had prostate issues at that time. So I don't mean to make anybody feel uncomfortable, but I, I do I think I went above and beyond for that presentation. <laughs> All right. Should the school board decide to move forward with the community survey, your team will work with myself and Tracy Jens, who is my successor when I retire at the end of June. Tracy joined us last fall after a long career as the communications director for the Grand Forks School District in North Dakota. I'd also like to share a little bit about myself. I spent 25 years working in the sports department at the Wisconsin State Journal in Madison the last 15 years as the assistant sports editor. I then spent 10 years as director of communications for the Middleton Cross Plains Area School District before retiring in 2021. And one of the people I worked with is Tabitha Gundrum right back there. And I taught social studies and journalism at Green Lake High School in the 1990s. And I have three siblings, all of whom have spent their entire careers in education. So we kind of are connected to the public education field in the state. This shows specific survey work we have done with school districts over the past six months. I will note up there that Pewaukee passed a $28 million capital referendum question in April 2024, while North Lake, which is a K-8 district in the Waukesha County area, passed a non-recurring operational referendum question in April after having one fail the year before. Mequon Thienesville is looking to survey the community next month about a potential non-recurring operational referendum question in November while Sheboygan Falls and West Bend want to survey the respective communities in the coming weeks about potential capital referendum questions in November as well. This slide highlights the process we use to develop all the surveys we administer. 
I will note we have already finished most of the first draft of, for the Wausau School District, partly because this is a tight timeline, but also because we're excited to partner with you once again. I want to stress that while every community survey we do has similar parts, no two surveys are alike. This is a collaborative process and it is crucial the school district provides a narrative and helps us inform residents about your needs, the process you use to identify those needs, and evaluate possible solutions, and finally why the option that you have chosen or will choose was selected. I presented about I presented at the WSB State Education Conference a couple times over the past decade, and I still believe the right solution at the right time with the right message is vital for any school district. Survey development can be done in as little as three to four weeks or sometimes a couple of months. As I noted previously, the proposed timeline for this community survey is a tight one, but it's certainly doable. I want to take a minute and explain why we are proposing a survey window in mid-May. We find districts that offer surveys at the end of the school year or in the summer see lower completion rates. And the lower the completion rate, the less reliable the data. So while optimally offering a survey in July would be beneficial since you have until August to, put a vote, to vote to put a question on the November ballot, we wouldn't recommend it. We want to get a lot of people taking the survey. Okay, so for everybody looking at this slide, um, we're going to provide data with three groupings. And I have a soon-to-be three-year-old grandson, so I like to compare the three sets of data we provide in a community survey to the story in the three bears. For our analogy, the all respondents data is too hot. That's because the majority of people who will complete the survey are likely going to be your district families or staff, and they're more likely to be supportive of whatever you decide to, to put out there. For our analogy, then, the comparison group is too cold. That's because the people in that group don't have a direct affiliation with your district and are less likely to be, support, to be supportive of whatever you decide to put out there. So for our analogy, the weighted group is what we would say is just right. And, that, and, why, we do, and why do we use 70% for, for the comparison group, as you load up there, and 30% for those directly affiliated with the district? That's because between 65 and 75% of eligible voters in your community don't have a direct affiliation with your schools. So if we were to look at the all respondent pool, you would think, oh, wow, we can get anything passed. Meanwhile, if we were to look only at the comparison group, you'd think it's going to be really hard to get anything passed. And both of those numbers are misleading. So we're going to provide that data. What I can tell you is that over the course of the three years while we've been doing that, um, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about different types of surveys in a second, our, our numbers until April were spot on using the 70-30 ratio. They were a little off in April, so I'm planning to look at all of our results and see if we need to modify those percentages slightly. So here's a couple, the next two slides are going to show examples of what this looks like in our report and what it'll look like in a presentation if we move forward together. Um, you can see that an all respondent number there, and that's a, that's a district in Wisconsin where we asked the question for $24 million. Very popular, a lot of support there. Comparison group was still quite high, and you can see the weight it's in the middle, but it's not as simple as saying it's half of one or half between all in comparison. And then an example two, I guess I don't press hard enough at times. You can see they asked for a larger dollar amount, and you can see how those numbers drop significantly. What that district decided to do was they decided to split the difference and kind of go between 24 and 42 million. And again, they were successful. A few other things I want to cover that aren't really in these slides right here. We often are asked about scientific versus convenience sample. What we do is a convenience sample. So what would happen is the district would send out a postcard to every resident in the Wausau School District asking them to take the survey, their households. All right, that's considered a convenience sample. A scientific sample, which you see with a gubernatorial or presidential election, is a case where a polling firm identifies a certain number of Republicans, Democrats, Independents to take the, re take the survey. All right? Scientific samples will say, oh, plus or minus three or four percentage points you can gauge. We can't do that with a convenient sample. But what we can do is look at the results we've had and see, have they been pretty close to being predicted? And the answer is yes, they have been. With any survey, the higher the participation, the more accurate the results will be. A good completion rate for our surveys is around 15 to 20% of whatever a district student population is. 
So 1,500 or so would be our goal for this for Wausau. I will note we are supporters of public education and are certainly happy when the results from a survey are positive. However, our number one goal is that the results are accurate so you can make the best decision possible for your community and your school district. A couple other things. There were approximately 100 referendum questions in Wisconsin on the ballot so far this year, with 90% of them being on the April ballot. The DPI website is still missing some results from April, but non-recurring referendums had about a 69% success rate. Capital had about a 59% success rate, and recurring referendums had just over a 50% success rate. So one of the things we'll want to decide, working with your leaders, is what sorts of referendum, what type of operational referendum question you ask. You remember a few years ago you asked a non-recurring one for two years and it was successful. I would say the vast majority of operational referendums asked in Wisconsin are non-recurring, and they have a much higher success rate than recurring ones. S lastly, since 2000, more than 1,300 operational referendum questions have been placed on ballots for community consideration. Over the past decade, that's still more than 570 operational questions. The success rate during that time is about 70% for operational referendum questions. So, again, it'll be your decision. It's, it's a potential action item tonight if you want to move forward with a survey. Obviously, I'm biased. I work for a firm that does surveys. But in Middleton, we did a lot of surveying as well. Not every district does. You can be successful without a survey, and I'm not trying to talk myself out of business. You know, what I would say is you have to have a good feel for the pulse of your community. And a survey is one tool to do that. What I like about surveys is not only is it a chance for you to get, gather data to make a really informed decision, but it's a chance for you to inform your community about all the work you've been doing. And I think that's important as well. It's a good opportunity to gauge the temperature. And, you know, considering the work you're doing with the capital, you know, from the capital referendum, it's also a good chance to see how people are feeling about that. Because let's be honest, one of the things we find is that if they have high satisfaction levels, they're more likely to support referendums than if they have lower satisfaction levels. I'm certain there's probably questions, and I've come close to taking my 15 minutes of a lot of time. So let me answer whatever I can. Open up the questions. Uh, start to my, from my left. Uh, Cody, do you have any questions? John? I guess one concern is after we've talked about this at the last school board meeting that I've had is just kind of where we're at in the climate of the community being knee deep in a capital, large capital referendum, um, projects that are being you know, executed right now that people might misconstrue that capital referendum with a operational <coughs> referendum that I would assume is a recurring <coughs> one because the point was to try to help us with um, teacher salaries and things of that nature. So I, I just I'm concerned that the where we're at right now in this point in time might might be confusing and and might. Uh, might draw some questions or some dissatisfaction with bringing yet another question about asking for money after a capital project has, you know, already been approved. So, I understand what you're asking, John. If I can, if it's okay, if I respond a little bit. Um, so the reality is, it's, it sounds like no, and I and I've already seen. I saw the budget presentation as well. That's how I was able to get a lot of the work done on the, roof, on the survey. Um, is the question doesn't sound like it's really a case of can we do a referendum. It's a question of will the community support a referendum. Mm -hmm. So a survey is, again, just like as a district, you can't go out there and advocate for a referendum question. You know, your job is to inform why, it, why you think it's needed. Mm -hmm. A survey is sort of the same piece. It's to, it's to inform the community about why an operational re referendum is the right solution at this time for your district and to find out whether the community agrees with you. So again, at the end of the day, if you want to move forward and try to ask, try to try to put that question on whatever ballot without a survey, you can. I think it's hard to know what the amount this community might support. Because here's the reality. I'm 60 years old. I don't have any children in schools any longer. If I didn't have a connection to a school district, usually the decision I'm going to make is based on the tax impact. How much is it going to impact my wallet? And that's how a lot of people in Wausau are going to make the decision. Your families are probably going to be supportive of a higher dollar amount because they know what the impact those dollars will have for their children. You know, that's the one reason why I like a survey. And again, I say this not as a member of the Donovan Group, but as somebody who worked in a school district for a decade. It's because I want to know before I put a question on the ballot, is there really going to be a legitimate chance for success for it or not? Karen, question? Um, 
Um, one question I have with regard to the data that you receive after the survey, uh, do you that you obviously said you use kind of the weighted group information and you would bring that before the board and say these are my recommendations on what your question looks like or I mean what beyond producing the survey then does your services provide with regard to that and or moving forward with um, educating the community if the board would move forward with a question are you a part of that work as well so Karen, that's actually two different things, so that's okay, I'll answer them both. So, so with the first one, what I will tell you is what I recommend to every district is to trust their data. And so, the, and the thing is, I could tell you, okay, this, I mean, you can, you can read what the numbers look like. What, ha what ends up happening is I find for school boards is sometimes it's in the gray areas. We know we can get this, but can we get to this? Because this is where we really want to be. And, and what I can help you is determine, okay, no, I wouldn't recommend that, but, I'll, but I, you can get to this dollar amount and be okay. I'm willing to do that. What I'm, what, I, what I'm not willing to do is say, oh, you need to listen to Perry Hibner and do this number exactly, because you know your community better than I do. We have services, and that's what I was referring to with Brian before, who's available to help with the district, because what I find is that districts, if they go out and work really hard between the time they vote for a question, and the election can improve the numbers by two to three percent. That's what we typically see. I don't want to oversell anything to people here. I've worked with one district where they did better than that, and I'll be honest, I worked with them, and it was my home district, and we moved it, we moved the needle by 20 percent. That's not typical. That's not what normally happens. So again, if, if we find out that you want to ask for, and I'm, I'm making a number up here, so I'm not trying to you know, scare anybody anything else, but if you want to ask for $3 million a year on a recurring basis, and you asked for more than that a few years ago, but it was non-recurring, you know, we might find that 55% of the community supports it. What we found in April was 55% on a survey turned into 51% at election time. So it, was, it ended up being closer. And that's where I can help you with that, some of that as well. But some of it's just a matter of, I always believe we outworked people in Middleton when we were there when we were doing capital questions and when we did our operational one. We had the largest capital questions two years ago, in 2012 and 2018, the largest operational one in 2022. I know it's a different community. I get it. But every community, I mean, communities I think have learned over the last 15 years that if they care about public education, we're not getting the funding from the state that we used to or that we need, so we've got to step up. And so then the other pieces are things like, I mean, I've worked with a lot of districts over the last year that ever since the 325 revenue limit increase, they go, well, what do you need our help for? Well, we need to explain that with what's happened over, since 2010, we're more than $3,000 behind per pupil on revenue limit, which means in Wausau, $25 million you'd have more if it had kept up with inflation. No questions, just, uh, I guess, support for, for doing this. I strongly feel that one of the roles that we have, that the board has in this, is to clearly explain what the implications are of, you know, if, if we don't do X, then that means this in terms of student-facing impact and, frankly, some other impact. Um, so it, as long as we can clearly communicate what those options are and what it means, um, should something pass or not pass, I, I think that's what we do and the, the community speaks. And Patty, even though you didn't ask a question, I'll just say that I'm a, I, I never, I always told people in our district, we're not scaring you, this is just our reality. So if you're okay with the new reality, I mean, that we have to lay off or not, you know, not renew, or we just don't fill positions, that's where we're going to be, which means higher class sizes. But the community needs to understand that there are implications to not going to referendum. I'm okay with <clears throat> doing the survey too. I would be curious as um, you're, when you're going to present the fee schedule to us. You, you sure, I can talk about it. Yeah, yeah. So we have our community base fee is five thousand dollars. So um, School Perceptions is the other firm in the state, and I've, wor I've worked with Bill Foster for a long time. He's great. The only difference I'll say is they charge quite a bit more than that. So and that's okay. We don't have nearly the operational costs that he does, and that's a, that's why he has to charge more. But I don't think that's very much in the big scheme of things, but that's ultimately for all of you to decide. But that's what the fee is, Corey. Okay, thank you. I'm going to just make one comment about the fact that we are we are listening to you and we are agreeing 
or saying yes to a survey, not a referendum. And I think that needs to be really stated so that the community knows we're not we're not voting a, a another referendum right now. We're no. voting on getting the question out to the community so that the community can give us an answer to the question. And I think that's the biggest thing that I'm concerned about. So if that's already been stated, I think we can move on and, and uh, go to a, a motion here. Okay. Um, I'm seeking a motion to approve the facility facilitation of a community survey regarding a possible operational referendum in f the fall of 2024. I can make that motion. Second. 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 Okay. No further questions. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain. Motion carries. With one. Abstain. Okay. Thank you. Thank Thanks everybody for the time. Appreciate it. Okay, we're moving on to continue the new business. Uh, 8B, uh, Wausau School District to the Literacy Overview of Act 20 and Wisconsin State Standards. Hello. Welcome. Thank you. There. I am Sandy Lewins. I am one of the district literacy coordinators. And I'm Melanie Hansen, I'm the other district literacy coordinator. So we wanted to do just an overview off of the Act 20 requirements and some of the work we've been doing regarding the Wisconsin State Standards. Um, so Act 20 was passed in July of 2023. Um, and since that time, um, the state developed a reading advisory council was created. And the council, along with legislation, has been really working on pinpointing um, resources and deadlines, and um, there were some amendments that we'll get into in regard to the bill. Um, so we kind of did just a quick little overview off of Act 20. So these six components are the main components that Act 20 encompasses. We are going to go through each of them and just give you a little brief overview off of them. Some of them we already have in process um, and we've been working on and some of them we are still kind of ongoing and continuing and waiting for further direction from the state. So lots of things have different dates, either an end date or a beginning date um, throughout the, the six activities. All right, so we're just going to go through each little category and provide a little summary and kind of a little background of what work has been um, we've been doing all year with our ELA Leadership Committee. So the first um, piece, a component of Act 20 is the leadership training. So this is actually written into the Act. Um, by July 1st, all individuals employed by the district that are in a leadership role have to participate in a six-day training as required by the law. So Sandy and I um, had spent quite a bit of time uh, researching and vetting options um, we did, as an ed team, um, with Katie and Julie, decide to go with um, CESA 6 for support in our leadership training. Um, some of the things that were really um, desirable for us is how we could really customize this training to fit our district literacy goals, um, focusing on our data and the goals that we have as a district. And then um, kind of circling back to some of our strategic measures conversations from the fall about providing like that high quality literacy instruction for all of our teachers at all levels universally. So that was a big part to that. And um, we did hear a lot of real positive, um, uh, in our research, we did hear a lot of positive um, strengths for this training um, so that they could then also, in line with the leadership training, include the teacher training. So we, they will not provide the teacher training, but their training will use the language that our teachers will get in their teacher training. So complex, but yet um, it all comes together. Um, let's see, I think this is, I was a little ahead of this. Oh, one other highlight of this is that, um, uh, oh, I'm so sorry, I lost my track, my place. Um, is the teacher training. I started to go into that with the Cox campus. So as another piece to the components of the training for the leaders, the other component is the teacher training. So in that teacher training, our, all of our teachers will need to go through um, their training starting by July 1st of 2025. 
So as we align timelines with this, we want to make sure that our work with the leaders also then is supported in our teacher training and how that's aligned. So we selected Cox Campus for our teacher training, again, through many different um, uh, information sources and people that we reached out to. Um, Cox Campus has a really great reputation with having the most updated and relevant training, the research and um, instructional videos for our teachers. Um, as an example, Sandy and I are going through Cox Campus right now, and we're very impressed already with um, the oral language module that our teachers will be um, participating in when they start their training. Um, that it really does a great job talking about the most updated research and providing really easy, relevant um, examples for our teachers to use on the spot in front of our students. So we're very impressed with the quality of that Cox Campus training. Then taking one step back, the training with our leaders um, through CESA 6, they will customize that training that our leaders get to align to the word choice and the strategies in Cox Campus. Um, we're excited about this because this is going to bring a real cohesive kind of calibration to all of our leaders. We feel like it's been maybe some time that our um, district principals and leaders have had a chance to calibrate and get some of this um, research-based um, and evidence-based strategies for them to help guide conversations in their buildings um, in front of their teachers. So we're really excited about the alignment for our teacher training and as well as our leadership training. Um, another component of Act 20 has to do with the resource adoption. Um, so that was kind of an ongoing thing. It took a while for the advisory council to be created, for them to submit bids. Um, they ended up approving four curriculums. They are Bookworms, Reading and Writing, K3, CKLA, EL Education, and Wit and Wisdom in conjunction with Geodes and Really Great Reading, um, which would be the foundational piece off of that. So Super Kids, which is our current curriculum, did not score high enough to pass through that initial screening process with both DPI team and the Reading Advisory Council. It scored 2.5 out of 4.0. A 3.0 was kind of that minimum recommendation to be moving forward. There were over 15 programs that got submitted during that time period. Um, and Super Kids was one of the lowest scoring resources based upon their rubric that they did. Um, and our district data trends that we've kind of been diving into have indicated that this is not the strongest universal program that we could use for all of our learners. Um, so as we kind of continue forward and continue looking through the components of Act 20, we realize that this is kind of shaping our vetting process of how we can do things. We have currently been working a lot with our ELA leadership team, which is a group of representation from K-5 classroom teachers. They're all listed there. Special education teachers, title reading specialists, literacy coordinators, school psych, speech language, gifted, talented, principals. Um, all have a part, and we are starting to really have a lot of those conversations related to our K-2 resource and where they feel that we have some gaps and where we have some strengths and where we need to move um, forward as we continue. Um, a lot of the conversations that we've been having as part of that ELA leadership team has been the benefits of having a cohesive K-5 curricular resource. Um, that has been a resounding kind of statement that has been made that they really want an explicit and a systematic scope and sequence of skills and having some of that universal language not only between K-5 but also aligning to the Wisconsin DPI's framework for literacy instruction and they really support having that K-5 curricular resource. You know, we've really been using this literacy framework to kind of guide that work in our ELA leadership committee. Um, you know, we're kind of flipping from more of a resource-dependent instructional approach to more of this the full reading um, and um, reading process in the, in the framework with the state. So we've really been doing a lot of work talking as an ELA leadership group around what makes up a high quality literacy block um, in universal instruction, as well as some of those guiding practices with the state. And when we spoke in the fall about our strategic um, measures goals, we talked about how literacy is a complex task. 
and we really wanted to bring back this visual to that conversation because it really is, um, you know, it brings in the foundational skills, the language skills, the cognitive skills, but then again, going back to that whole child approach and fidelity to our students. So you'll also see encompassing that as our social emotional learning and um, interest and relevancy and really focusing on our, our learners, um, especially our diverse populations of learners. So we felt like this was a really great framework visual to show how we're really always um, thinking about the student and the intentional learning that is expected throughout um, the state framework. Um, another um, part to this that we also wanted to bring back is in that um, uh, strategic measures meeting we talked about how we really need to um, use a strong universal system of support, that our materials do matter, but what matters the most is what we do with those materials and all of those other defining elements that encompass literacy instruction as that complex structure of supporting all students. Um, and that kind of pulls us to just a little bit of some district data that we have. So this is our forward. Um, students, percentage of students who are scoring proficient on the forward exams. So obviously the first graph is in third grade, the second graph is in eighth grade. As you can kind of tell, we're having really stable trends. So we're not having any huge spikes, we're not really having any huge um, decreases either in terms of where our students were at, which just means really kind of solidifies that fact that we need to intensify and improve our universal instruction um, in order to really be able to ensure we're reaching all of those students. Um, off of that. And really using that as a springboard to talk about how it cannot be resource driven, it has to be standards driven, and to the relevancy and the rigor of what our standards are asking our students um, to do and to um, show what they know in the classroom. So we are really trying to build that mindset of how do we target our instruction and our instructional strategies using an evidence-based research to really lift the learning for our students um, so we can see that growth on district data. Um, and then just an update of where we are now. So we um, have been researching and vetting um, all of these components as required of Act 20. Um, in our ELA Leadership Committee, we really have been focusing on a vertical alignment of those standards and what that looks like from grade level to grade level. We think about it as going up a staircase, what our students are expected to do and asked to do in grades K how that progression of learning um, goes, K-5, five, 5, but also into 6-8. You know, how do we transition our students from fifth grade into the middle school? And we've been having some really great collaborative conversations across um, the district K-8, and also keeping in mind that standards is going to be one of the components of those individualized reading plans. Um, back to kind of the components, we have a screener component that is um, part of Act 20. That was something that has been kind of in process for a while. They just recently passed. It is now called 2023 Wisconsin Act 192, and it delayed the implementation of the screener until January 2025. We at this point do not know what that screener is. Um, DPI will be releasing it in July of this year when they sign the contract. Um, due to that new um, federal law or the state law, it is going to push some things back so our screener will now just be administered once in 4K, moving forward twice, and it'll be administered in the twice, so like fall, or I mean, sorry, winter, spring in the coming year, and then it will move to three times. That is currently a very, a system we have in place currently with our screener that we're using. Um, and we're really trying to work on that foundational support at our universal level. Um, and we are talking and kind of problem solving how to do a soft start. So we, we feel like this could be one of those snow plows and we're really trying to ensure that we are um, rolling things out for staff and everyone to feel confident and comfortable. Um, once then the screener is given, um, this is also delayed due to the Wisconsin Act 192, but students who score below the 25th percentile on that will have to be given an individualized diagnostic. Um, we are also waiting for follow-up conversations of what those could be. They are not going to be identified. You do have choice as a district. Um, and I kind of, we listed the things in there that it has to entail. Um, and it's trying to be very strategic. So you are really trying to pinpoint that area of weakness for students 
which then entail um, students needing to have a personalized reading plan. So on the next slide. Um, and that's really reflecting a targeted literacy strand. Um, so really that's why we're focusing so hard on shifting our instruction to align to those standards, our framework, and those evidence-based strategies that we know. A lot of that is that work that we're doing within our ELA leadership team. We've shared during some district in-service time um, with staff and with principals. Okay, so I think just kind of in summary, we're just, um, you know, we have to go slow to go fast, and we've been really, um, had to be educationally humble um, to listen and learn and reach out to um, other folks for um, some of those questions that we've been wondering about, what is the right fit for all of our teachers in getting those right tools into the hands of everyone in our district. And we really have been intentional in making sure that not only do we follow that framework, and the standards and the guidelines of Act 20, but we are also very intentional with everyone that we're partnering with across the district, making sure that we stay in collaborative conversations with our special ed department, our title teachers, our EL teachers, and making sure that anything that we build or communicate or articulate to our staff is also reflected in our EMLSS framework. Um, and that um, is just kind of a conclusion of our overview. Um, we're mindful of timelines, um, and we're you know consistently part of DPI updates and um, open workshops that CISOs hold for us to gather information and clarification about this um, around the state. And um, we just continue to um, work on timelines and making sure that we are making um, careful decisions that have a cause and effect across the district in a positive way for all of our teachers and kids. Any questions from? Yeah, I've got a question. Um, so we've got Super Kids K2 and Wit and Wisdom 3 5. Um, Super Kids obviously is going to change um, because we don't have a choice. Um, it sounds like Wit and Wisdom possibly could because you're looking at a K-5 alignment, so we have to see how that turns out. Um, I know you're not presenting that to us yet, but when do those current contracts expire? Like, How long are we locked in with Super Kids and how long are we locked in with uh, Wit and Wisdom? Sure. We are on um, a year-to-year -year contract with both programs. Okay. So 3-5, um, um, we will renew January or uh, July 1st. Um, this summer, and then Super Kids, we have no obligation to them beyond this school year. Okay. Um, they have reached out to ask um, if we are interested in extending a contract. Um, we have told them that we are exploring all options with our ELA leadership committee. <coughs> we have not taken a formal vote in that committee, but we have asked in the questions on where they want to go next, like what makes sense. 100% um, of our respondents said that they do value a cohesive K-5 curricular resource, um, but knowing also that Act 20 changes our vetting process a little bit. We have not made any formal vote decision. And when I say that the super kids will be changing, uh, I'm correct, right, that, that that one we have to change, right? I believe so. I feel like with okay. our personalized reading plans and the parents being able to sign and agree to those plans, I feel like it would be in our best interest if we did not have a program endorsed by the state. Right. Okay. Thanks. Other questions? Yeah, this obviously, just based on a time and material standpoint, this is a big investment, yes. significant investment. Um, two questions. One, is the state providing any funding to meet these mandates? They are providing funding, but they're not going to start considering funding until I believe they'll start releasing in 2026. Um, they will wait until all districts submit their interest in receiving funding and then disperse monies based on an allotment percentage, based, I guess, depending on how many schools submit and then to what total. <coughs> okay. The, the, screener, the screener will be... Um, covered, or the state is paying for the screener, um, but it sounds like that has been a previous component off of that. The leadership training, the teacher training, the resource, it will all be um, the cost of a district. And we don't have a guaranteed number um, from the state. They say up to 50%, but we don't know of an exact number going into it. So, and I guess that's where I'm going with it, is that obviously we'll need to start developing a budget associated with implementation of this sooner than later. Um, okay, and then my, my last question, I think I know the answer to this, but I'm hoping I'm wrong. 
has the state identified with all of this investment um, any specific goals on what this will improve? I think that they're hoping to build literacy scores across the district. Our state averages a reading proficiency. Um, what's interesting, an interesting component to this is they are hiring someone to lead this work in the state. And items such as like the personalized reading plan are going to be written and drafted by the state coordinator. Um, to our knowledge, the state coordinator has not been hired yet, so some of these things have not been released yet because they don't have a person that's drafting and publishing some of these. But they haven't, re they haven't come to us and said, hey, you guys are going to do all this and we expect your literacy scores to increase 5%. They have not yet, no. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and I, I smile only because my comment was going to follow in that same line. But uh, DPI is definitely feeling the pressure uh, with COVID the way it was and how we have lost ground uh, that DPI has to do something. And usually they push it back to the individual districts and they're going to say, you do this, this, and this. My question is not so much for their fear of not raising everything. My concern is our, our district. My concern is what are we doing for our PLCs, the teachers that really are going to be in the trenches. And the DPI will make these comments way up here, but it all comes down to us really implementing and being concerned about our own students. So I, I ask this, in our PLCs, what software are we using? Because we're really data driven here. And you need to have software that's going to identify these students coming through K-5, K-6, and then moving up, that's the building bricks for everything, and, and they need to be there. So what is the software that we're going to be using, or are we all already in that? I, I would say that right now we have, we rely on forms and EduClimber, but I think that's the importance of the stakeholders at the table. You know, we meet at least twice a week with the special ed department, um, the EMLSS team, um, you know, Katie, Julie, um, ML. the ML department, like we have everybody at the table designing how, how can we re redesign our data conversations of how we talk about our students. And I think that one thing authentically that Sandy and I have echoed across the district to staff, like what we do at Act 20, we, we own. And what can we do that and do it well for our students and our teachers? Like, yes, these are all requirements, but what do we do well so it trickles down into our classrooms for our kids and fidelity for our kids? And that's one thing that our team is doing right now is developing kind of a system for PLC conversations of, you know, the, the type of evidence that we bring to the table to talk about what students are learning and doing. And then I'll turn it over to Sandy in case she wants to add to that. Um, yeah, one quick addition. I, I feel, do feel like Wausau does have the structures in place. Um, EduClimber really provides that database for us. So if we are sitting in a PLC and we are pulling up students and that kind of component, and like Melanie mentioned, we are working a lot on building into EduClimber a lot of those systems and structures and forms. Um, so everything is housed in one location um, as we move forward. So I'll say a positive thing about CESA 9 and all the CESAs. They saw a lot of things down the line and really got us in the direction of an climber because of PLCs being so important and data is so important. That software is a great software. It's been around for about 10 years now, but I think you can continue to make it even better based on what we want to put into it as well. Correct. Correct. I didn't mean to get off into different software, but I think it's very important that you know we're going to have these these items come at us from the state, their concern, and wherever that concern is coming from, it comes down to us. So thank you. Um, that is data that we've been asking for. I mean, we can ask for specific data, and you can bring that up and add your claim as well. Correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. For sure. Yeah. All right. Any other questions? If not, thank you very much. Thank you. Very informative. <laughs> Okay, moving to 8C, red granite request. And uh, it is at this time, red granite charter school would like to request approval from the board to expand the grades service from 
4K2 to 4K3. This would create a multi, a multi, say it correctly, multi-grade classroom for grades two and three. This change would not require more space or staffing. It would be a benefit for students. Correct. Correct. Okay. Yes. Thank you. So my name is Michael Hughes. I am the chair of the governance board of Red Granite Charter School. The request is largely, I think, self-explanatory, but to add a bit of texture. We are opening our doors to students and families for the first time this upcoming fall. And the plan was to start uh, with grade up to two, when we'd have four classes running on a single track system. We've got pretty good enrollment numbers. Um, we have full or darn full numbers for the first three grades. We expected second grade would lag behind a bit based on a number of factors. It has, and there are a number of families of upcoming third graders that have reached out that are trying to get their students enrolled in our school. Under the current plan, we can't do that because we're only approved for up to second grade. So what we think is most appropriate is to combine grades two and three, and therefore we would have more students in the class, but we'd also be able to accommodate the families that currently cannot be accommodated. Uh, this is something that is not atypical for Waldorf-inspired schools, especially at their inception. This is also an issue that came up when Tomorrow River Community Charter School began. Uh, it's my understanding they had a combined um, school, that, or a combined grade that went naturally through the eighth grade. They didn't experience any hiccups. They found it to be a workable issue, especially when developing a school from scratch. And that's the genesis and basis of our request. Okay. Any questions from board members? I have one. Um, so if the third grade numbers come in high enough that you don't have enough room um, and you have to go to lottery like you, I know you do with some of the younger ones, um, are you able to limit that just to a third grade lottery so that the second grade student families that have already expressed interest get their spot or would it be like a second slash third grade lottery? If we had to apportion and create sort of a ratio, you know, X uh, percent of second graders, Y percent of third graders, we, we would be able to do that. I would imagine we wouldn't go anywhere beyond a 50-50 split. For the sake of transparency, our numbers right now are that for that second grade class, we've got seven second graders that are looking to enroll. We've got five third grade students that have already tried to enroll, and we've got a number, uh, another pair of families of third graders that want to enroll. So just naturally speaking, we're already at that 50-50 split, seven of uh, second graders and seven of third. Okay, thanks. I think that uh, ends the questions. That was a question I think we all had. We don't want to bump anybody out uh, if they've already gone through the process. So I'm seeking a motion to approve the expansion of Red Granite Charter School to serve grades 4K to 3. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Health insurance presentation. 2425. Um, Josh will share a presentation regarding health insurance for 2425. And John, welcome. Again. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so we'll do a brief health insurance presentation tonight. John Price from M3 is here. We work together on our uh, self insured health insurance. So he'll give a little background as to what's happened both locally and in the industry, uh, as well as with our insurance. And we'll give an update on something the insurance committee has been discussing that we'd like to bring to the board. And then at the end of the presentation, we will ask um, for your approval on that 4% renewal that we've been talking about uh, for health insurance. So with that, I will hand it over to John. Hello everyone, I'll keep this relatively brief to the extent possible so there's time for questions. Um, I do think that before we um, talk about recommendations going forward, it might make sense to see where we're at and how we got where we're at. Um, it isn't all bad, but I do think we're going to have to make some changes. Um, if you look at the slide, you can see from 2013 to 2017, uh, the picture was different. Your district was different in that your employees were going to a mix of providers more. 
for example, Marshfield Clinic was a lot more prevalent at the time. You were insured with Security Administrative Services, which is owned by Marshfield Clinic. So at one time, earlier in, in that time period, uh, 2013, 2014, you had maybe 60, 70 percent utilizing Marshfield Clinic, for example, as a provider system. Because you were insured with security and you'd done a relatively good job, I mean, nothing is perfect, but I would say that um, your experience was better than most districts. And I think most of you know that you had a flat renewal uh, for a number of years. You transitioned towards a high deductible health plan for the first time, albeit not totally successful at first. A smaller percentage of the district went to the high deductible health plan in conjunction with the HSA. And um, what, we, what we started noticing towards the end of that time period was your claims started to spike and we can see that uh, employees started utilizing Aspirus more as time passed. In 27 and 20, 27, 2018 plan year was not a good year. You were going to get a, a relatively large increase at that time, and the decision was made to use uh, the request for proposal process and to look at the market. 70% of employees by that time are ready, having utilized Marshfield Clinic, the recommendation by the insurance committee to uh, the district was to make a change to uh, Aspirus Health Plan for administrative services as the third party administrator. That was a big change, admittedly, in 2019. From 2019 to 2022, a lot of things happened, um, including COVID, which we'll get into in a minute. Um, but you implemented a lot of changes as well. You introduced two additional plans. You had historically only had one or two plans. Um, and with retirees, you actually had four plans. There was a big difference. One of those plans was what we sometimes call in the industry a narrow network or a, a community network featuring Aspirus. Um, that made sense to do that. And again, you stabilized for the most part. 2023, 2024, we saw a lot more provider consolidation. It did impact this district. We also saw that claim utilization as a result of pent up demand and COVID-19 hit uh, our area the same way it did nationally. Some people might say, well, I'm not sure COVID really uh, impacted our claims, and that would be difficult to prove one way or another. But one thing that we do know is the impact of shutting down certain services, surgical procedures, did then uh, create an environment where employees did not get some of the care that they otherwise might have gotten. You also got hit with high cost claimants. We are seeing in record numbers um, high cost claimants right now not just in Wisconsin or the Midwest, but nationally. And the insurance committee did make recommendations that this board approved for January 1st, 2024, and those changes were made. The next slide just kind of backs up a little bit and says, you know, what, what are some of the things that are impacting the care that, um, that really we, we have to adjust our plan for? And a lot of them are things that the district can't easily do something about. You can do something about it, but not easily. So for example, in 2017, we saw this consolidation occurring in that Marshfield Clinic bought St. Joseph's Hospital. In 2019, um, they looked at trying to sell their system or merge at least with Gunderson. Didn't happen, almost happened. In, in March of 2019, Asparis started selling their own health insurance plan. It was a big change in our community because it's like, you didn't have a Ford and a Chevy before. You know, it's what you kind of have with Aspirus and Marshfield Clinic. Um, 2020, of course, COVID-19 hits. Um, there's some disruption for sure. It reduces availability for surgical procedures. August of 2021, Aspirus completes the purchase of seven local hospitals. Big change in this community. Um, you know, hospitals like uh, Sacred Heart St. Mary's and Rhinelander Regional Medical Center and um, St. St. Joseph's Hospital in uh, Stevens Point. Them really getting a foothold meant that instead of having at one time, Ministry, Marshfield, and Aspirus with three systems, and Ministry, as you recall, became Ascension. Um, still three systems, Ascension, Aspirus, Marshfield. You have now just two systems. In December of 2023, we also know that um, Marshfield Clinic came very close to merging again with Ascension. Ascension rejected the deal. Um, where are we going with the conversation about this? Well, I think what's happening is provider systems are becoming increasingly more expensive and uh, them consolidating isn't necessarily helping the community in terms of you managing your cost. That's really what we're seeing. 
we're seeing employers seek alternatives to traditional health care. We're seeing higher trends. We're seeing an increase in demand. One of the things that we've seen uh, as a result also is a little bit more ownership on the part of employers, including school districts. They're starting to say, what about having our own direct primary care? Why not have uh, an environment where we have really more control over our own utilization and how much we spend on that utilization? So what is direct primary care? It's employers contracting directly with the provider system, usually not a multi-specialty conglomerate, but a smaller system. The DPC, or direct primary care, stated goal is usually to improve access uh, and uh, equality as well as to reduce cost. How do they do it? Fixed fees. So right when I go in for service, I have fee for service. If it's $270 for this visit and they refer me to a specialist, it might be $870 or it might be $8,700. These kinds of referrals are not sort of as regulated by a particular entity and insurance companies that own their own health plan don't necessarily have uh, the ability or even maybe the desire to start going against their own physician group in those recommendations. So fixed fees means that if you went in 15 times and your district was paying $38 per member per month, that doesn't mean that the, you pay 15 times $200 a visit. You pay nothing per visit as an employee and neither does the district. You've already fixed the fee, you know. Um, being whether it's five visits or, or 15 visits, it's the same fee for that employee. We also know that population health management, some of your other initiatives related to wellness can be coordinated. In the next slide, what we've seen is um, this has been working more prominently in the private sector. So we believe that um, based on what we're seeing in the statistics, it could also work here. 80 to 85 percent less expensive for lab services, 50 percent fewer emergency room visits, 30 percent fewer days in the hospital, and 65 percent less imaging means a reduce in cost. Also, they can spend, hopefully, at direct primary care level, more time with your employees. You know, spending that time is important. Um, you can get more out of your health care when you have the time to do it. One example would be an employer with 850 employees in this example, uh, $18 million in annual health care spend, very similar to your numbers. Outpatient labs uh, saved were 309,000, imaging 125,000, ER 50,000, referrals 210,000, and a big one is the diversion of specialty care at $817,000. So the total is 1.5 million in this example. We also know, and we're on our last slide already, which is good to open up for questions. We know that um, you know it, it's not an automatic, it's not a silver bullet. It would take a lot of education. Um, it's, it's one more thing that we can do to help manage costs. Uh, in 2024, the changes that were agreed upon will have roughly for this year a 6.2% reduction in spend. But since your spend is trending upward, it puts us in a, a scenario where it might not be enough. In fact, it doesn't appear to be. Our renewal projection um, in working with the district is anywhere from 12% to 13.6% for 2024 and 2025. So. Because of that, we have been talking with the insurance committee, as always, and uh, the recommendation coming out of those discussions is a request for proposal being sent out for direct primary care for the district that could be effective as early as January 1st, 2025. Um, the second thought on this is consider reweighting some of your plans. You know, you've got plans that are um, not necessarily encouraging people to take uh, the more cost-effective plan. And we're going to look at that and then uh, potentially additional plan changes and contribution strategies as needed. But there is a 4% recommended increase for July of 2024, along with us looking at direct primary care for 2025, and then continuing to evaluate on a monthly basis how you're doing between now and then to determine if another change is required in January in addition to direct primary care. Your loss ratio for 2023 was north of 120 percent. Means for every dollar you budgeted, you're spending a dollar 20. It would make sense that you have these increases. So the changes, including direct primary care, are recommended, you know, as a way to kind of, um, you know, head off some of that trend and to do better at managing our own costs in the years ahead. Questions? Yeah. Uh, 
questions. Just one on, on the, the DPC model. Remind me what services are all included in the PMPM fee? So the, they're uh, primary care services. They're not going to include specialty care. So common services would include preventive care, wellness screenings, um, as well as uh, they do perform lab services on site, which is great. But if you came in for a strep or you came in for a cold or a flu, or if you came in uh, you know, even with a pain in your side, for example, what would happen is oftentimes an MRI would be recommended, but instead of being recommended to the tune of $3,500 for that MRI, it would be recommended for a cost of maybe $600 by recommending that the employee utilize SMT or SmartScan rather than one of the traditional systems that's much more expensive. But the services there are not going to include imaging nor procedures other than minor procedures like removing a cyst or something like that. But um, most of them are just direct primary care, uh, the same things you can go to Valley Medicine for. So then is, is the ER diversion savings, is that derived from plan design or from the primary care docs themselves handling more? It's both, but it, it is more from the, the physician's side because what happens is by improving access, you avoid employees utilizing ER when they maybe wouldn't need to. So do they, uh, this is my last question, but do they um, guarantee things such as appointment windows, like you know, you're not going to be out past X number of days or weeks, things like that? They do. They actually guarantee them, which is unusual. Um, and it's, it's, I, I always am nervous to use that word. I'm not used to that in our industry, but for some reason, they have been doing that. They've been guaranteeing uh, windows and opportunities, so much so that they'll, they'll go uh, 24 to 48 hours guaranteed. And then that's an advantage because you don't get that with traditional plans. Yes. Anytime sure. you can nail a physician down, I say do it, right, Cody? I agree. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Other questions? If not, I'm seeking a motion to accept the presented health insurance premium changes effective July 1st, 2024. So moved. Second. No further questions. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? <laughs> motion carries. Thank you very much. Appreciate the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Moving on to E. Dr. Katie Caldwell and Julie Schell and Sarah Budney will share a brief presentation. And I didn't stress brief in any way. Uh, the elementary science standards have been revised with an emphasis on uh, phenomena in science and engineering practices of K-12. The last elementary science resource adoption was in 2008. So they didn't present basic, this. There's nothing added to that, correct, from the last? Unless there's questions. There you go. Thank you. So I'll just keep on. I, I could tell I was putting you on the spot back there. So, no, no, no. We're just pausing. <laughs> we're, we're okay back there. That's we're okay. Good. We're good. All right. I'm seeking a motion to approve and to adopt uh, FOSS pathways as the K-5 core resource with full implementation in the fall of 2024. 20, and 25. So moved. Second. Okay. Any further questions by anybody? If not, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you very much. Science course sequence. Do we have a presentation on this? Or was that already yeah, taken care of? Okay. Uh, that presentation was taken care of in our last meeting, and so we're seeking a motion to approve the 912 science course sequence at the start of the 2024-2025 school year for both Wausau East and Wausau West. Second. Okay, no further questions. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, okay, next, Mr. Cale Bushman will seek a board direction related to staff requests for their children to attend the schools where they work. Was that already taken care of in the last meeting? Yeah, I did all kinds of stuff while you were gone. I was just going to say, I'm going to here, but that's okay. You did a great job. Thank you very much. Uh, 
I'm seeking a motion to approve adding language to policy 5120 and that allows children of staff members to attend where they work. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you very much. Uh, okay. I'm seeking a, to ask the board to share any professional growth and development for the month. Anything happen that you'd like to share? If not. I just want to maybe say thank you. Sit. If that's okay. Um, I just want to take the chance to just say thank you to the staff and the community and the whole administrative team and this board. Um, it's been an honor to serve you and alongside of you. So I just think there's a lot of really great things happening here and um, it's been hard work but also really special work and important um, to just work on behalf of kids and advocating for public education. And so, yeah, I just wish you all the best. I gave it my all and I'm looking forward to great things for you guys in the future. So, thanks. Karen, we greatly appreciate your work and we appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Why well, I always got to follow stuff up from Karen? I mean, it's just <laughs> not fair, right? I mean, jeepers. Uh, you know, I want to thank the community as well for giving me the chance to serve on the board. It was, it was an honor and it was, it, was, it was fun and challenging at times, definitely in the beginning. Um, I'm grateful that, you know, the reason why we came on the board and the things that we were able to get moved forward, um, I'm happy that it proved, we were proven right in the, the things that we decided to do as far as, you know, with different things that were going on at the time we first got on the board. Um, and I'm glad that the naysayers were never proved to come to fruition. Um, so I'm happy about that. But I do thank the community and I thank working with all of you guys. And I'm kind of sad I won't be able to work with Mr. Bushman in the future because I think he's a great guy and he's going to do a great job for the... The, the future of the district, and I think uh, Dr. Hiltz as well, he's done a great job for the district, and um, thank you. Thank you, Cody. Greatly appreciate your effort and your work that you put in for three years. Thank you. Legislative liaison? Yeah, first of all, I'll share um, a letter I received from um, Laura McGlown. Um, her family is in Marion actually, and they uh, have their, two of their children, James and Heidi, um, have been participating in West West Hockey. And uh, they, their students um, take classes with us through WAVE, and they have uh, given us high praises for their experience in WAVE, and both of the um, kids have had a great time being part of the hockey program. Uh, been traditionally homeschooled. So I wanted to share that first. Uh, otherwise, on uh, last week I had the CSA 9 meeting and our main thing during the meeting was uh, we reviewed uh, their excellence in teaching program and, and how many uh, of the districts with, <clears throat> excuse me, within the CSA uh, utilized that along with, with the WASA staff. And then we also did a, a quick review of uh, some of the bills that Governor Evers actually vetoed that were school related. Um, and there were four uh, in, in one of our newsletters here. Um, just uh, Senate Bill 335 with both superintendents not being licensed by DPI. And then there was another bill, uh, rights reserved um, to a parent or a guardian. Uh, related a little bit to the CESA 9 program with a pathway for pairs to gain a license that is um, different than an initiative going on in DPI, DPI now and also different from what CESA 9 offers was uh, Senate Bill 608 and then uh, there was a Senate Bill 688 change in the thresholds of, uh, of different projects within districts for uh, requiring uh, competitive bidding. Uh, so those were some of the things that we'll see, you know, maybe in the future they'll be brought back up based upon teacher needs and administrative needs around the state. And I think that's why a couple of those got introduced. Uh, so that's all I have on that. Well, thank you very much, Corey. Mm -hmm. Appreciate that. Uh, Dr. Hiltz, do you have any? Additional items? I do, just a few. Um, I would like to piggyback and thank Karen and Cody for your work and just to let people know, you know, that um, 
you never know how hard leadership is until you step in and do it. So anybody who, who's willing to do that, um, you deserve all the, the praise and respect that, that, um, that anybody can offer. So thank you for what you did. Um, a note on Thursday of this week, Dr. Jill Underly is coming here. Last week we had the governor. Uh, to, we had the, you know, the, the opportunity to have him sign a very important bill, uh, AB 232. Uh, this week, Dr. Jill Underly is going to come. She's going to do a press conference focused on teacher attraction and retention. So very, again, a very important topic. So we're, we're honored again to have her here. There'll be a press conference, obviously. Uh, would, would love to have the board there. Um, lastly, oh, sorry, yes. When will this be? Um, Thursday at? Thursday at 1.30 Statine Elementary. 1.30 Statine Elementary. Thank you. Uh, lastly, we are, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, a principal that you just hired, uh, happens to be here tonight, Mr. Andy Reiki. Would you, sorry, surprise, would you mind standing up and saying hi? There, congratulations. Well, uh, Mr. Eric Reiki will be the principal at John Marshall Elementary. He was a teacher there, uh, was interim, highly respected as a teacher, highly respected as a principal. Um, very, very, very uh, excited to have him join our administrative team, so welcome. And uh, I think that's all I've got. Well, being a uh, resident of John Marshall area for many, many years, and having my sons and my daughter come through that elementary school, no expectations. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome aboard. Thank you very much. All right, continuing on, I would like to reference the written board member liaison district activity report uh, and ask that it's entered into the official record. Thank you very much. Uh, with that, I'm asking you to consider uh, or to go into close to consider the employment, promotion, compensation, or performance evaluation data of an employee pursuant to Wisconsin State Statutes 19.851C and to consideration of contracts for preliminary notice of non-renewal of Statutes 19.851C as well. Seeking a motion. So moved. Second. Roll call. John Kreischer? Yes. Pat McKee? No. Cody Nikolai? Yes. Jennifer Paoli? Yes. Corey Sellers? Yeah. Lance Trava? Yes. Karen Vandenberg? Yes. Jim Boucher? Yes. Thank you. Um, 